anybody down this hill, get out of the way. I'm coming down, I can't stop. So this is a story that British rally legend Paul Burt said on his deathbed was the best story he ever heard. Now this is a story that did not happen to me. This is a story that was told to me by the person who experienced it. But it's such a great story. Many people enjoyed it and I wanna tell it to you today. Through a friend, I knew this older guy named Jim Lumley. And Lumley was one of these fellows, he's an old guy. He had dropped out of school in like seventh grade went on to do like drywall or something like that, but you know, was a just a smart guy, you know, hardworking guy was just very smart despite his lack of education. He was a smart guy and he, you know, rapidly had his own crew, became a manager, bought his own company, turned it into this multi-million dollar business. And this would have been probably the 70s, late 70s. Turned into a multi-million dollar business and sold it. This was around the time of like, you know, Convoy and the first Smoking the Bandit had come out, you know, trucking, you know, C.W. McCall, all this kind of stuff. You know, trucking was cool back then. It was that, that romantic age of just trucks with all the airbrushing on the side, taking the back roads and Smokey and the CBs and all that. Lumley told me this story. He said that he had sold his business and he just always wanted to be a trucker. So here he is, this relatively young guy with literally like a million dollars in his pocket in 1978. He goes out and just cash buys like the newest, fanciest, Peterbilt, chromed out 18 wheeler that you could find. You know, gets his CDL, does all that kind of stuff. You know, he pays somebody to put some cool airbrushing on it. It's got every light and all the chrome and the big stacks and the sleeper with the, you know, diamond tuck velour in it. I mean, this thing is just the deal. So he gets this truck and, and he doesn't really want to get, he doesn't want to be hauling chickens and groceries. He wants to do like cool stuff. So he gets like a heavy haul permit, you know, the big trailers, those big, you know, cranes and that kind of stuff. He got some sort of a contract to from like Boston to go to like Portland, Oregon and haul back three of those big, like the big wrecking balls that you know you swing into buildings and knock them down. So, uh, you know, he drives out, you know, gets the first one, drives all the way back with it, drops it off, you know, goes back. And it, by the way, legally, he can only bring one at a time. And, you know, and I think the romance of it all sort of after he'd driven back across the country twice, you know, I think the novelty was sort of wearing thin. So he gets out to get the second wrecking ball and, you know, they're lowering it. He's coming off of a ship from Japan or China or something like that, you know, so they're lowering it onto the truck. And he said he looked at it and thought, you know, I got the best truck there is. My truck can pull two of these at once. Now this is way over the weight capacity for probably the truck, the roads, the DOT, whatever, but it's the seventies and it's not like today with all the computers and everything like that. So he said he, slipped the crane guy some cash and they loaded two on and he goes to the scales to leave the port and slip that guy some cash too and you know his things just work that way now he's going to get paid for two trips but he's only going to have to make one so he's pretty excited so he you know meanders through town on the way out of town he saw this hitchhiker on the side of the road you know kid look you know like he needed a break or something so he stopped and it was a german kid who was over here just backpacking around america and he was going trying to get back to the East Coast, going to somewhere, Boston or Provincetown or somewhere like that. So Lonely said, I'm going across country. Hop in, I'll give you a ride. This is your lucky day. So the kid gets in, you know, throws his backpack in the back, sits in the truck. They hit the road and, you know, and if you're familiar with the Northwest, you know, you've got the, the coast and then you've got this really steep, you know, coastal range of mountains and then it kind of levels out and it's pretty much smooth sailing until you get to the Rockies. He said the climb over the mountains, he was trying to stay off the major highways because he knew he was overloaded and although he had been able to pay off the crane guy and the dock guy and the scales guy, he may not be as lucky down the road. So he'd stick to the back roads and, you know, come that way. So he found this little pass up over the mountains and he, he said it, the truck was doing it, but it was struggling. He said it took him most of the morning to just get this truck very, very slowly up this hill. So the, you know, the German kid speaks some English and they're chatting a little bit and he's going up the mountain and he said as he topped the mountain, you know, I don't know how much trucking experience he had at that point, but enough to know that as soon as he crested the hill, things started going badly you know, went to downshift the truck. And, you know, with big trucks like that, there's, they call it like losing a gear. You know, the truck just takes too much of a load and the transmission pops out. And then, you know, with a big truck like that, you have to double clutch it and synchronize the gears. And if the transmission starts running faster, then you can get the 
synchronizers in, like you can't get it back into a gear. So the weight, the strain, whatever, he pops out of gear and the truck's basically in neutral. So he starts picking up some speed and of course he lays into his brakes, but these are some big heavy wrecking balls. And, you know, he said he's riding the brakes and he's on them pretty hard and he's trying to get it back in the game. He's just grinding gears and just can't seem to get the truck back. And, and, and the runaway truck, he said, was only about five miles an hour at first. It wasn't like it was careening away really quickly, but he couldn't stop it. And this was another, you know, hour long trip down these roads. So he's on the brakes, he's on the brakes, and the truck starts picking up speed, and he, he said he was just riding it, riding it, riding it, and all of a sudden he just heard this, poosh, you know, one of the airlines to the trailer blew off, and, you know, he's braking again, and poosh, the second one went off, and, and suddenly he realized, like, I, I can't stop this truck. So he said he snatched his CB, and he called, and he just, you know, kind of broadcast a couple miles around. He just said, anybody down this hill, get out of the way. I'm coming down. I can't stop. Everybody clear the road call came back immediately there's a traffic accident down here there's people all over the road there's emergency vehicles like you got to stop the truck he said i can't stop the truck i'm running away they're like you got to crash it you got to stand off the mountain we you can't you can't come through this town out of control and he's like oh my god you know what am i gonna do so he, he you know he just kind of looks around and he's you know you know he was a lonely was a tough guy and he was a man's man he you know probably didn't debate the decision too long but you know he just looked at his truck and he realized that i got to I got to jump and send this thing off a cliff. And he, he turns to the German kid. He's like, we got to jump. You got to jump out of the truck. And he said, they're only going about 15 miles an hour. But, you know, the kid was just petrified and just sort of in shock. He's like, you got to jump. And he reaches over and he opens the door and he said, jump, kid, jump. And the kid just couldn't move. So he just he said he slapped him. And just like in the movies, kind of knocked him out of it and just pushed him and, the, you know, pushed him hard so he'd clear the wheels. And the kid just goes out the door. You know, he said, you know, going down the road, he could see like a, a switchback and it was just a guardrail in the sky. There wasn't even a mountain. It was just some massive, you know, Pacific Northwest kind of cliff. And this was his shot, you know. So he said he opened the door and got out on the running board and, you know, held onto the wheel and just kind of gave his baby one last look and just cranked the wheel over towards the guardrail and, and just jumped. And he said, you know, he was the truck was probably going 25 miles an hour at this point. So he jumped, hit the ground, rolled. You know, the truck just crashes straight through the guardrail like in a movie, like Thelma and Louise, just off. According to Lumley, he hit the ground, rolled a few times, kind of rolled up onto his feet and ran to the edge. And the truck was still in the air, just had just plummeted. I mean, these are these type of cliffs that people, you know, those wing suits and base jumping off. The truck is still in the air, he said. And of course, it just hits. And as he put it, that you could have put the biggest part of that truck in a wheelbarrow. It just destroyed it. But as exciting as that sounds, that's not where the story really gets exciting. At the bottom of this mountain, there's a cliff, there's a hillside, there's a lake at the bottom. And on this lake was a fish camp. You know, people would go up on the weekends and, you know, they'd cook your, you'd go out and catch trout or whatever, and they'd cook them. There was a bunkhouse and a boathouse and a meal house and that sort of thing, you know, kind of a live the mountain life sort of deal. Now, in the court case that followed, the people at the fish camp said they thought it was an avalanche. Now the truck pretty much flattened where it landed at the base of the cliff, but these two wrecking balls continued down the mountain. There was a boathouse at the end of a dock. One of these big giant wrecking balls is just rolling down this mountain like that big rock in Indiana Jones. Miraculously, nobody was hurt. Wrecking ball number one went between the bunkhouse and the chow house and just went right out the boat dock, destroyed the dock, the boathouse, and all the little fishing boats that were in it. The other wrecking ball just went right through the camp kitchen building, but thankfully nobody was in, just obliterates it. Well, there's another part of this story. Um, if anybody's ever lived on like a Corps of Engineer Lake, Lake Lanier, anywhere like that, uh, National Forest, if you go cut a tree down in a national forest or on a lake that's owned by the Corps of Engineers or the federal government, there is a fine associated per tree. And I think even at the time, this is something like, you know, several hundred dollars for each tree. Well, because Lumley was willfully deceiving the federal government as to overloading his truck, he had done it on purpose. He was knew he was violating these rules. He was therefore considered negligent because the forest which his truck crashed into was owned by the National Park Service. So they fined him for every tree that was destroyed by the truck and the two giant trails of destruction. I mean, we're talking a half a mile as these giant wrecking balls rolled through the forest. 
His insurance company didn't want to pick up the tab because, again, he had willfully and negligently overloaded the truck and bribed a dock operator to overload the truck. So Lumley, out of his million dollars that he had made selling his drywall company, he had to pay off the truck. He had to pay for the boats and the boathouse and the new meal house and all of the trees that he destroyed going down this hill. He said he was stuck in the Pacific Northwest, literally broke with no more money. The funny story was, is of course, this made the papers and the news and everything else. Well, the local town took a shine to this poor German kid. It was okay, save a few scratches and bruises. They all chipped together, bought him a bus ticket to get him back to Boston. Lumley had to wait for his brother to come and pick him up and thus start his entire life over after his misadventure with these wrecking balls. We'd like to thank Transparent by Glass Parency for supporting the VinWiki YouTube channel this month. Transparent just released the first system to allow customers to buy wheel and tire, dent and ding, or key fob replacement warranties direct from their phone or computer. The days of having to overpay at a dealership and having no other options are over. So you can visit transparentwarranty.com, enter your vehicle and your zip code, no personal information, no hassle, and see what coverage is available for you. So be sure to check them out today.